Okay. Well, welcome everyone to Reaching Higher Aviation Art by John Slemp. John, our presenter today, is has been a commercial photographer for 20 years, and he's loved aviation since childhood. So about six years ago, uh, he decided to specialize in aviation photography. He has a very long list now of clients, and among them are Goodyear Aviation Tires, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, and Women in Aviation International. Well now, John, I'm going to turn the program over to you so that we can see your wonderful artwork and welcome today. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me, Madeline. It's a pleasure. Um, I would uh, like to say, you know, first off, um, I have been a commercial photographer for 20 years, and in that time, I've worked on all sorts of um, projects for clients from, you know, magazine covers to uh, annual reports to advertising and, and so on. And, and, and that's all fine and good, but after a while, you want to do something that's not only, uh, you know, you want to do something that's professionally satisfying and personally satisfying as well, if you can. Um, because that essentially gives you the impetus to continue producing good work, uh, because it, it is something that you have some personal investment in, I should say. Um, so let's start off. Um, this whole journey essentially started in 2001. I was trying to teach an intern the zone system, which is a, a method developed by Ansel Adams of exposing and developing black and white film. And this image is a Douglas DC-3, and it was shot down in Griffin, Georgia, just south of Atlanta, uh, on a warm, very warm summer day. Uh, we had actually gone down there to try and photograph a P-51 Mustang, which is a World War II fighter plane. And for whatever reason, that fell through. And so this airplane was parked out on the ramp. And I asked for and received permission to shoot it. And, and this is one of the images that resulted. Uh, it was shot with a wooden 4x5 field camera. Field camera means that it folds up into a box and is transportable in a backpack and so on. And um, uh, and for, and Tri-X film. And so uh, we started the process and between, you know, me teaching and shooting Polaroids and essentially taking our time at the same time, several images resulted. And uh, this one, and I believe the next one, this is the fuselage detail. Um, and it was all shot with natural light, uh, sunlight. and. Uh, and I happen to use a 25 red filter here, which gives it that uh, deep tonal range. The upper right-hand corner is actually, um, right in this area here, is actually um, uh, the sky. And when you put a 25 red on there, uh, it turns very dark in tone, which is intentional. And so it increases the contrast range and really pops you know, and, and the idea being the same, same here, this is also the sky in this, this part of the image here. And uh, the idea being that it increases the tonal range uh, from, uh, you know, highlights in this area here, which is um, almost white, but there is detail in this area to black. And there is actually detail in here, but I sort of print it down a little bit, as they say because um, I didn't want those details to take away from the overall design and feel of the image. Um, so this image and the previous image is really what started the whole thing going. Um, I showed them to a friend of mine in town who's also a commercial photographer, and he liked them so much that he bought a couple of prints. And the more I showed them, the more the, the res positive uh, response that I got, and it just sort of fueled the fire. And um, and as you mentioned, aviation is something I've been interested in since childhood. Um, I used to sit in second grade class trying to draw pictures of Piper Cubs instead of paying attention, but 
Um, obviously, I passed second grade. Um, and so this went from one thing to the next. This was shot that fall of 2001 at the um, uh, at Falcon Field in Peachtree City, uh, the Great Georgia Air Show. And this is the Delta DC-3, their original aircraft that they started carrying passengers in, which they found flying freight in the Caribbean somewhere in the mid-90s. And they purchased the aircraft, brought it back to Atlanta. And uh, if memory serves, there was about 80,000 man hours spent in restoring this aircraft. And it's just stunning. Uh, I wish they still flew it, but they don't. It sits now in the Delta Museum down at Hartsfield. Um, and, it, if, and again, if I remember correctly, the aircraft is only one of two machines that are actually in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, they even went so far as to obtain on eBay, of all places, original Life magazines from the week it was put into service. And now each seat back has a copy of the magazine from, I believe, 1941, somewhere in there. Um, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful aircraft. And uh, rumor has it they may fly it again at some point. This is a detail of the landing gear. Uh, and all of these images were shot with the wooden field camera. It's still one of my favorite cameras, although I don't get to use it much anymore um, because of the way digital has changed things so much. Uh, but I may actually go back to it because Polaroid, uh, as you know, went out of business. But there is a group of folks in uh, uh, the Northeast who are trying to resurrect it for both a 4x5 and 8x10. And if that comes back, then I will definitely begin shooting film again, because there's just something about it. Um, and you can scan it and make very large prints that hold detail. This is a um, shot of Ron Alexander's DC-3. Um, this was digital. Um, and it may look like there's something wrong with the aircraft when in, in actuality this is normal for a rotary engine aircraft. Um, they leak oil a lot. And uh, rumor has it that they're not leaking, they're marking their territory. So um, it's pretty normal for those type of aircraft. And actually, um, when in World War I, one of the reasons why you saw the aviators with the gigantic scarves is because they actually used that in flight because the engines threw off so much oil. And so that was part of the reason, not not to mention the panache, but uh, that was actually a practical reason for wearing the scarves at the time was they, they needed them. Um, so this is Ron Alexander's DC-3. He's a pilot uh, south of Atlanta, uh, owns Peach State Aerodrome. He was a pilot in the Air Force in Vietnam for a short while and then flew for Delta Airlines for over 30 years, and uh, he's been involved in aviation all his life and um, still is, is quite active. He owns this aircraft and a Stearman Cloudboy, which is a very rare early Stearman biplane. Uh, he flies that regularly, and uh, he, he's just a pleasure to know. Very nice, um, down-to-earth, quiet man, actually. Um, this is a Lockheed 12A Electra Jr., which is owned by Joe Shepard of Peachtree, um, I should say of Fayetteville, Georgia, um, down near Peachtree City, uh, south of Atlanta. And this aircraft was used in the movie Amelia, uh, I believe in 2010, when that filming took place. And um, Joe is a retired Northwest pilot, and he and his brother-in-law, who's a Delta mechanic, spent close to 18 years restoring this aircraft. And there's only a handful of them flying, less than 10 that I know of. And Joe flies this aircraft regularly. Um, and as I even received grief from some folks because of doing that, but like he says, that's what they're for. And uh, I, I can't agree more. It's, it's also a really beautiful, beautiful aircraft. Uh, because of the lines, it's just become one of my favorites, to be honest with you. And this is one of the vertical stabilizers here. There's there's one on each side. There's two. And one of the hallmarks of the Lockheed 12 is this little tab that comes out from the vertical stabilizer. 
The Beach 18 looks very similar, but it doesn't have that little outboard tab on each side. And so uh, a lot of people confuse it. Uh, here you can see the little outboard tab again right here. And, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this aircraft is owned by David Marco of Jacksonville, Florida, also a Lockheed 12A, and this was shot in flight uh, during the Sun and Fun in March of uh, 2012. And rumor has it Dave spent a pile of money on this airplane restoring it, and it looks brand new when you go up to it. Uh, both externally and internally. It's just a remarkable aircraft. Uh, it was so nice inside when I looked inside that I didn't want to get in it for fear of sweating all over it. Um, but it was originally a corporate aircraft um, owned by Phillips um, Petroleum. And, um, and Dave actually exhibited the aircraft in 2011 next to their tent at Oshkosh. Um, so it was a real privilege to shoot this. This is what they call air-to-air -air from one aircraft to another. I was in a Cessna 210, um, which is a pretty good size Cessna. It's bigger than a 172, which you know most people are familiar with. And we took off the rear baggage door and photographed out the door. Um, so it was, uh, it, it was, it's really the best way. There's a lot of control, and um, it's not near as risky as you might think. Um, this is another shot of vertical. I wanted to try some verticals just in case I um, ever had the opportunity to use it on a magazine cover. One of the reasons you leave space in a commercial job, you know, it, it looks like the, it's not really full in the frame, but that's intentional because a magazine uh, name could go across the top here. There's room here for type, you know, see page 36 for the article on radial engines or whatever. And um, and so that's one of the reasons why you leave space like that. And um, I actually learned that from a Sports Illustrated photographer that I assisted one time. Um, this is another shot, just um, tighter crop and so on. And what you try and do when you're um, doing this when, when you're actually out there photographing is you make a ton of pictures and basically do the editing after the fact um, because, you know, the time for making pictures is the most precious and you can sort out all the pictures, the keepers and the non-keepers and that sort of thing later on. But in about an hour, I did over 500 pictures of memory serves and um, it was a pretty fair number of keepers too. It was over 50% as far as sharpness goes. and um, and uh, it was a real treat to learn a few things, and uh, I can't wait till I get the chance to do it again. Um, this is Orion STA. Um, first, this aircraft was first built in 1937 and was restored to flying condition in 2007 by David Harwell and his team at Barnstormer's Workshop. And this is actually on the same field um, uh, that Ron Alexander owns, Peach State Aerodrome, down just south of uh, Atlanta. A uh, small grass strip outside of Griffin and a little tiny bird called Williamson. And uh, this aircraft actually set several records at the time uh, for aerobatics and also for speed. Um, and it was a trainer uh, right up prior to World War II. And uh, actually quite a few were exported to New Zealand. Um, the detail here, the first image was digital, but the rest uh, will be uh, images that were created on film, medium format camera, which is bigger than a 35, but not quite as big as the, the wooden camera, the 4x5. And, um, and then they were all, they were all scanned. Uh, I had to ask, I had no idea what this post here was when I first made the picture, and I just couldn't figure it out, and I had to ask. and. Uh, it's actually a rollover post because behind the seat over here, there is no roll bar like you would see in a racing car. So uh, that's the purpose of that, to protect the pilot's head and so on. Here you can see it here in the edge of the frame. This little glass tube here is actually the fuel gauge. And it's as simple as a bobber in a pond um, with a little 
extension here, and, and you can see it, as the higher the bobber is, the, the fuller the tank, and that's, uh, that's how sophisticated the fuel tank was. Um, but a beautiful, beautiful aircraft. And um, while I was at the Reno Air Races last fall, I actually saw a plane that looked very similar to it. They have a subset of the Reno Air Races has um, an event called the National Aviation Heritage Invitational. And this aircraft, there was Orion there, and it looked awful lot like it, and I didn't have my records with me, so I couldn't check the N number, which is the registration number. N numbers are American. Um, and when I got back, sure enough, it was the same aircraft that I had shot in 2007. It's now owned by a fellow in California. Um, but just a beautiful airplane. And this is actually the nose. Uh, the uh, spinner and the um, propeller are right up here. And the engine in this aircraft is actually mounted upside down um, so that it gives the propeller more clearance uh, when it's landing. Because if, if the if the propeller was down here, um, if the norm, if the engine was in its normal configuration, then the propeller would be down here, and that's too close to the ground and uh, too risky as far as potential prop strikes, which you don't want. Um, this is the empennage, which is the French word for the tail section, and um, this is the, the vertical stabilizer here, the horizontal stabilizer here, and then the fuselage. And I'm actually standing on the ground when I photograph this. Um, and it's not a big airplane at all. Um, and it's a tail dragger, obviously, so uh, it was didn't require any jumping around on ladders or anything. Um, but I just like the lines of it quite a bit. Uh, these are the exhaust uh, pipes here, and of course the wheel pants and so on and the, the wing. Um, but it just, I don't know, there's something about these older aircraft. They have so much more character. And also, um, just the, the fact that they're not, I think, quite so streamlined and, and so, so, um, ah, what am I trying to say? Um, just so, yeah, streamlined, I guess, is the right word as the aircraft are today. They, they have a ton of character to them. Not only from age, but but also from wear, and being in the sun, and, and you know that sort of thing, weather, and um, and just just like an older person, they they develop their own personality, very much so. Um, this is a Ford trimotor, and a lot of folks aren't aware of it, but Henry Ford was actually in the air, airplane business in the late 20s, and he built. His company built right around 200 of these aircraft, and as you can see, it's it's corrugated metal, not steel, but I believe it's aluminum, um, and uh, which was done primarily uh, because, uh, well, you have to remember in the late 20s, aircraft were still relatively a, a new phenomenon, um, especially metal aircraft, because up until the late 20s, almost all the aircraft have been made out of fabric and wood and reinforcing wires and that sort of thing. And um, and in order to make air travel more palatable to the general public, it was thought that they needed to be more than just tube and fabric. And so Henry decided to make it out of air, uh, metal. And he put three engines, this is the engine on the nose here, he put three engines on the aircraft just to reinforce and in the flying public's mind that it is a safe aircraft and there was redundancy in case one of the images decided to conk out. Um, so um, a detailed shot of the um, uh, the rudder. This is the rudder here and the horizontal stabilizer and looking back towards the front of the aircraft. And um, and this is just a rudder shot here. I isolated it against the sky, essentially. It's just uh, And again, the, the character that's in this aircraft, this aircraft is actually owned by EIA, EAA, the Experimental Aircraft Association. And they fly it around the country, uh, much like was done in the early days, um, you know, landing at airfields and giving rides to 
to folks who want to go for a ride on it. If I remember, there's nine seats and two pilots, and each passenger has their own window, uh, which makes it real nice. Um, and it gets off the ground surprisingly fast, um, and in a short distance. It's uh, well, the engines that are on it now are 450 horsepower each, and I believe the original engines were about 300 each. So it's been probably a 50% increase uh, in the power that it originally had, which also helps it get off the ground. Uh, and it'll cruise between 90 and 100 miles an hour. So not real fast, but it's pretty reliable, and, and it's, a, it's a treat to fly in it, it really is. Um, a, a fuselage detail with a porthole near the rear. Um, and Eastern Airlines was one of the early proponents of this aircraft. This is the uh, vertical stabilizer and rudder. Again, this is the rudder and the vertical stabilizer. So as you can see, this, this corrugated skin and the wires, and the reinforcing wires and so on, really create a lot of drag, which is another reason why it's so slow, but it's a very sturdy aircraft. Um, and this was at the, the Reno Air Races last fall and early morning sunrise, and I happened to see the shadow of the, the right engine against the fuselage. So, uh, you know, part of this whole exercise when you're out making pictures, and, and I say making pictures as opposed to taking pictures, a commercial photographer goes out with the idea that, you know, photographs will be made. It's not an if proposition, but it, it's, a, it's a when and, and how proposition. And usually there's, a, you know, if it's for a commercial client, there's a lot of thought that goes into it and pre-planning as far as, uh, you know, where's the sun going to come up, uh, what models are going to be in the shot, what are they going to wear, what are they going to do. Um, you know, if we're going to be there all day, there's plans that need to be made as far as feeding everybody, um, you know, backing up the files, um, making sure you have all the lighting gear you need. It, it becomes quite the production. And, and when you see, you know, a photographer out working like that in the field, so to speak, it is a production because of all the, the pieces that are required. It's not unusual to have at least one assistant, if not two or three, depending on the complexity of the job. And, you know, I used to tell, and I still tell assist, uh, people that, uh, clients that um, assistants are not really a luxury. What they do is they, they are my hands and they allow me to think, which is really what I should be doing while I'm out there making pictures for them. And they're, they're doing the, you know, moving the lights and that sort of thing. I can do that, of course, but then it takes me away from what I'm really there to do, which is make pictures for them. Um, so uh, this is another, you know, more or less detailed shot looking straight up. And here you can see the three engines on the tri-motor. And I used a little bit of fill flash. Otherwise, this would have been quite dark in this area here and under here. But I used a, a little bit of on-camera fill flash to add a touch of light in there just um, to even out the values. And uh, it helps in the overall picture. Otherwise, you know, areas get too dark and they just become a dark air, um, blob and, and, you know, it loses visual interest. Um, this is a more modern aircraft. I've moved into shooting more modern aircraft as well. And this is an F-22, uh, which, of course, was built in Marietta, Georgia. And um, this was shot in uh, 2010 at Nellis Air Force Base just outside of Las Vegas while I was attending the ISAP, the International Society of Aviation Photography Conference. And uh, part of our conference, uh, we had the opportunity to go over to Nellis and shoot during a red flag exercise, which is quite a big deal. There are many countries participating in this exercise. And, um, uh, and they fly up into northern Nevada, where there's not uh, too many populated areas. And they essentially have air, air war games. Uh, where they test out their systems and drop practice bombs in the whole nine yards. Um, and court, they have coordination between countries. It's really quite an extensive operation. And uh, this is an American A-10 attack, ground attack fighter um, that was on the ramp. There were four of them across uh, going this way. This was the, the left-hand aircraft as I was facing it. 
and the engines were actually running uh, during this time. There was a team going from aircraft to aircraft, and they were checking the practice bombs, pulling out all the uh, safety uh, pins and so on, and making sure the aircraft was ship shape, and then they would move to the next one and, and on down the line. And when everything was set, they all four took off as a group. And uh, really almost like a ballet to watch because they, they were so good at it. Um, as, um, as mentioned earlier, one of my clients is Goodyear Aviation Tires, and this was shot for their calendar um, in 2010 at Oshkosh. Oshkosh is the largest air show in the country every summer in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And the, the technical proper term for it is Air Venture, put on by the Experimental Aircraft Association, but everybody that's been and continues to go back just calls it Oshkosh. And um, uh, this aircraft was fully restored in 2010 and basically came out of restoration two weeks before I shot it. It's a uh, British Seafire, which is a Spitfire with folding wings for carrier duty. The wings fold, the little tip ends, the wings fold up here, and then I believe the brake is somewhere in here again and on each wing, and it folds up so that they can get more of them on the carrier deck. And uh, this is the only aircraft of this type flying in the world right now. And uh, this was on the calendar last year. Now, what they do, it's a poster, essentially, and they put one aircraft on there per year. So we're in the third one this year was Lockheed 12 that uh, uh, is owned by Joe Shepard and there's two more to go and, uh, and then they'll be ready for some more images hopefully higher than me which I'd like. Um, uh, this is a Fock Wolf 190 uh, the nose spinner this is called a spinner this part here and, and the nose and so on also shot at Oshkosh um, and I'm told they painted them like this so they could see them in low visibility. Uh, plus, it looks cool. Um, but um, the Falk Wolf is also a very rare aircraft. Um, this is a Corsair, which was in production at the end of World War II. It came out just a little late to see action, but they did actually fly them in Korea. And this aircraft did see action in, in the Korean War. And apparently still has some patches in the, uh, over the bullet holes in the side of the fuselage somewhere. Um, and it's on a fellow named Jim Tobel, who's out of South Carolina. Um, and he's an active air show pilot now as well. Beautiful, beautiful aircraft, meticulous restoration. And uh, just a real treat to watch. And, and uh, when you get up close, you really start to realize how large these aircraft are. The prop on this is... Um, can't remember exactly, but it's between 12 and 13 feet long from from one end to the other. So it's quite a large prop, quite heavy uh, to be swinging around there in front of that aircraft. Um, and again, obviously with folding wings for carrier duty. Um, so I had the opportunity to go to the Reno Air Races last fall. And as many of you probably know, there was a tragedy there in... Um, in the fall of 2011, when uh, Jimmy Leeward's plane went out of control and, and he spun into the ground right in front of the grandstands and was killed, along with um, 10 or 11 other folks and many people injured. Um, and there was a, a strong possibility that the races would not be held last fall, but, uh, you know, th things turned around and um, it did happen. And... Um, and this is uh, shot in the EAA tent area, and I believe the impact from where Jimmy's plane went in is essentially right out in front of this tent. Um, as you can see, now they have concrete barriers and a lot more stringent controls on how close people can get and, and made some changes to the course and changes to the inspection procedures on the aircraft. And, and uh, so, you know, hopefully, good Lord willing, from the from now on, uh, things will continue to be safe. It was really pretty interesting watching the races. They have all manner of classes of aircraft, which I didn't know. Um, this is one of the classes, um, and uh, don't quote me on the, the particular classifications. I'm 
not that well schooled in that yet, but um, they were flying Pitts aircraft early in the morning. And as you can see, this is the famous Reno start finish pylon. And um, essentially the, the guys start out, you see this little white dot right here, that's one of the pylons out on the course. I believe that's pylon number two where I spent some time later in the week there. And um, uh, the, the photographers who are in attendance basically buy for a spot on the bus. You know, if you, you get on the bus early enough and and because uh, they only take so many people out there, then you get a spot. And if you get on too late, you know, well, you don't get on. So um, uh, anyway, I, I did wind up going out there at the uh, insistence of my friend Arnold Greenwell, and, and that was uh, pretty interesting as well. This is one of the cool things about Reno is you can get right up next to the aircraft. There's a little um, rope essentially that keeps people from, you know, going right up and picking up a wrench. But um, you can see you can get pretty darn close to one of the uh, many of the competition aircraft. And this is precious metal. It's a P-51, and as you can see, it has a counter-rotating prop, which uh, I believe it was the only one there, if memory, if memory serves. Um, and that aircraft is based down in Florida. Um, you know, one of the things I like doing um, when I'm out at uh, an event like that is, is look around for something that's different and unusual. And some, you know, you know, a lot of people can go out and shoot the aircraft and, and uh, you know, make the, the everyday pictures and so on. But I'm looking for something above and beyond that. And I just happened to look up at the, the stands and lo and behold, this image presented itself. And that's pretty much full frame. I, I try not to crop my images uh, unless necessary. So I like to frame them up that way. And, and this has become one of my favorites from Rio. Um, and this is the, the rally bunch in, in section three, I believe. They all wear orange shirts. They're there for the week, and their job in life is to cheer on the racers and and have a good time. And I'm told it's very much like a Mardi Gras environment in more than one way. Uh, we won't go into detail, but these folks have a good time, and uh, apparently come back year after year after year. And um, so here's some of the pictures from where I'm standing at Pylon 2. Uh, I believe this is on Sunday, the last day. And this is a um, Sea Fury, um, a British made aircraft, and one of the fastest aircraft in World War II. And um, just, just beautiful and um, really stunning. This is probably the most famous aircraft of World War II, the P-51 Mustang, fighter airplane anyway, uh, American made, and really made a huge difference towards the end of the war because it had much longer range than previous aircraft uh, and um, was fast too, uh, which made a big difference in air-to-air -air combat and so on. Um, so um, this is a T-6, and as you can see, this is the pylon that I pointed out earlier in the picture. The pylons are only 50 feet off the ground. Essentially, it's a telephone pole with a couple of 55-gallon drums that are welded together, and then they're hollowed out and mounted to the poles such that the judges can see up through the drums. And if an aircraft, as it comes around the pylon, if the aircraft is seen through the drum, then that's called cutting the pylon and they're docked time. Uh, I can't remember how much time, but it's significant because it's seconds count in this race anyway. Um, and so they, they try and get close, but not so close that they actually cut the pylon. Um, and as you can see, some of them get quite low too. And because of that also, it's, it's really kind of a treat um, in an auditory way because they make a lot of noise and it's really pretty cool you know, the sound is, as they go around, it gets louder and louder, of course, and they're right on top of you, and then they go away, and it fades, and it goes almost back to nothing, and then it builds again as they come back around on their next pass, and it's really a lot of fun just hearing and listening to the sound. This is an L-39 jet, yet another class, um, and these were originally Czech, uh, made in Czechoslovakia uh, as trainers for the Soviets and the um, Eastern Bloc 
Air Forces, uh, I believe in the 70s, starting in the 70s, and now they are being purchased as private aircraft by people all over the world, but I'm told there's uh, around 200, 250 of them here in the States that are in private hands. Uh, they're not that expensive, about a quarter million dollars, which is a, a bargain in airplane in the airplane world, and um, supposedly quite a bit of fun to fly. Um, simple, rugged, reliable. This is a kit-built plane that participates. They have a kit competition, um, um, and this is the Nemesis NXT. Uh, beautiful, beautiful aircraft. Beautiful lines. Beautiful paint job. And very fast, uh, I believe this is over 300 miles an hour as it goes around the pylon too. Um, and just to, and it's not that big of an aircraft actually. Um, and then, you know, part of what I do also is create images for corporate clients and so on. And this was shot for a client in Kalamazoo, Michigan last summer. Um, uh, they had two corporate jets, actually, and this is a detail from a Global Express, Bombardier Global Express, and this aircraft had just come back from China, and nonstop, I should say, and uh, I had until noon to shoot it when they all jumped in and took off again for another destination, which I wasn't uh, aware of, but uh, beautiful aircraft. And um, they wanted some images for their offices and, and corporate offices and so on. So we went up there on the way to Oshkosh and, and made it happen. And, you know, while I'm – obviously, I'm looking at this aircraft from a lot of different angles and so on. And, and you know, the, as the sun got higher, the, the shadow got more and more pronounced. And so I noticed that and moved around to the rear – and decided to incorporate the shadow, which looks very bird-like, actually, uh, into the image. And I just thought it worked well. And, and you know, and, and some folks might um, be put off by all the, the cracks in the pavement and so on, but I like that. It gives it character again, and um, uh, it's not so sterile, not so perfect that it's, it's clinical. Um, because literally each aircraft does have its own personality and, uh, and of course, not to mention the people that fly them, uh, a detail of one of the engines. Um, and this is a detail of the nose. Um, and again, uh, had, had I wanted to, I could have isolated this area here in Photoshop and actually selected it and turned it just a touch so that this would line up perfectly with that. But again, I, I started looking at it and it just seems it, like it would be too perfect at that point. You know, it, it's not, um, there are, when you get up close to these aircraft, you know, they look great from a distance usually, but when you get up close to them, they really do start to have their own little characteristics and little, little tweaks, little flaws, little, um, uh, foibles, shall we say, that, that make them unique. And uh, so I decided to leave that in the picture. Um, and, you know, and those are some of the creative decisions you make, you know, during and after the fact, um, you know, because I did notice it. And, you know, if, if you're paying attention, you will notice things that perhaps other folks don't. This also is another example of, um, purposeful propping in this way. This was, again, left open for a magazine cover, um, you know, letterhead, uh, Sports Illustrated, or whatever the case may be. And, um, and again, there's room for type and so on. And, um, you know, you'll notice a fair number of these images are sepia tone. I, I've gotten so I like converting images to black and white because it becomes much more about the shape and the design of the image in, when it's in black and white as opposed to color, which uh, color evokes emotion. And, you know, which is fine. And there are times when you need that and want that. Um, and then there are times when I just like isolating elements and, and really seeing what kind of image I can, what kind of a design that I can create within the frame. And this is one of those instances here. 
this is actually on the side of the fuselage. The pilot's windows are right up here on top. And um, um, and this is a um, angle of attack indicator and so on on the outside of the aircraft, um, which I had never seen before, actually. So I thought that was pretty interesting. This is towards the rear of the aircraft. Um, and in the afternoon, I believe this is a Challenger 605, which is also a Bombardier product, slightly smaller jet. <clears throat> Um, so we shot the, the Global Express in the morning, and they took off, and then we went to lunch and came back and shot the Challenger 605 in the afternoon, basically until dark. And again, I believe I made 700 pictures that day, somewhere in there. Um, so it was uh, pretty, I, I started to say trying, but trying is not the word. It was fulfilling. Um, visually, but also it, it becomes quite taxing mentally because you're, you know, if you're doing it right and paying attention, you're, you're spending a lot of brain cells looking as opposed to just seeing, and there is a difference. Um, and I'm trying to create patterns and shapes and so on within the frame, not only with uh, positive space and so on, but negative space in these areas and so on, and, and it, it all, hopefully it goes together in some sort of interesting visual way. Um, this is just the last little bit of sunlight is hitting this the tip end, this wing tip here, um, as, as it was going down. This is a pretty picture in color too, but I wanted to show it in black and white just um, because the tones are, are so gradual, so beautiful. Um, and, uh, and that makes a lot of difference, I think. And then, of course, we get to what I've been doing for 20 years, photographing people. And, um, and to me, the pilots are as interesting, if not more so, than the aircraft. I mean, the aircraft are, are cool in and of themselves, but, you know, if they're just out on the ramp uh, with no pilots to fly them, then it's just a, a, a pretty trinket. But the people who fly them are really what make them go. And I had the opportunity in 2009 to photograph several pretty well-known aviators for women in aviation international. And this is Patty Wagstaff, excuse me, who is three-time national aerobatic champion in a row, which is quite difficult to do. And that includes men and women. And she's participated in international. She's in the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Um, she sits on the board of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Um, she's a big deal in the aviation world and um, and I had the opportunity to photograph her in the week's hangar. Uh, essentially I set up a studio in the hangar uh, during your venture at Oshkosh in 2009 and um, made pictures of these ladies and as you can see her her flight suit perhaps looks a little large and it was and I asked her about it and she said it's a brand new flight suit. She was sponsored by Cirrus at the time and she said they just made it too big, and uh, which I thought was kind of funny. So we went ahead and made a picture of that. Um, half hour into this session, she's telling me about, you know, life outside of her, her flying. And she likes horses, and she likes dogs and animals in general. She's got a parrot. She's got little terriers and a horse. And, and she pulled up her flight suit, and on her socks are embroidered little terriers. So a half hour into this, I'm photographing Patty Wagstaff's socks. And, you know, had you told me that earlier, I would have said, yeah, right. But it was actually pretty funny. And uh, we were both laughing while that was happening. Um, this also is at Oshkosh. And this is Tom Dindorf, who at the time owned this aircraft. This is the Shell Oil Stinson. You know, some aircraft become so famous that they have names. Um, and this aircraft was built in 1938 and purchased by Shell Oil, which is why it's yellow and red. That's their corporate colors. And it was flown for two years before the war by Jimmy Doolittle, uh, who was a civilian at the time. The war broke out. He went back into the service. And as you know, in 1942, led the famous raid on Tokyo. Um, Tom uh, had to sell the plane eventually. and um, it's now owned by a fellow down in Texas. Um, and this was, I did shoot this airplane. This, this shot was done as a, as a thank you to Tom because he graciously lent us this aircraft for the Goodyear Aviation Tire Calendar. 
And um, I can't show you the picture because they haven't made their final selection yet, but when they do, um, I, I can't wait to show the world the rest of them because several of them were actually pretty darn stunning. Um, beautiful, beautiful aircraft. Uh, this also was done in the Weeks Hangar in 2009. This is B. Haydu, Bernice B. Fall Haydu. She goes by B. And um, she was a WASP in World War II, Women's Air Force Service Pilots. And that was a group of about 1,100 women who were selected, most of whom were already pilots when the war broke out, and if not all of them. I believe they had to be pilots to even be considered, now that I think about it. And they ferried the brand new aircraft from the factories to their points of debarkation, debarkation around the country. So they flew bombers, they flew fighter planes, uh, you know, you name it, they flew it. And B continued to fly after the war. Uh, she married, had three kids, and I uh, believe at one time she and her husband even owned an aircraft dealership. Um, so she was quite involved in, through in aviation through her whole life. She's still around. Last year, she in 2012, she was inducted into the Women in Aviation Pioneer Hall of Fame in Dallas. And a uh, very nice lady. I expect to see her again in a few weeks here. Um, this is a lady who's a real estate agent down in Florida. And this airplane is a kit-built Vans RV-12. Uh, it's a two-place side-by-side aircraft. And she didn't build it, but she bought it right after it was completed and before it was painted. And she knew a fella at a local auto paint shop, and she told him what she wanted, and he made it happen. And this airplane was a showstopper at Oshkosh a couple of years ago, and the little girls were just all over this aircraft. And I even, while I was um, looking at it, uh, you know, sizing it up for shooting later, a little girl came up with her mom, and I heard her exclaim, I want one of those. And it was really pretty funny. Um, but uh, very nice lady. And uh, as soon as I finished this picture, she literally ran around the other side, opened the canopy, jumped in, fired it up, and took off going back to Florida. So uh, that was that was nice to see. Um, these are the hands of Ray Williams, an original Tuskegee Airman who I photographed last February in 2012, just outside of Atlanta, his home. Um, and of course, I have you know portraits of him and so on. But I thought this this was one of my favorite pictures of the whole session because uh, I knew they had been awarded the Congressional Gold Medal uh, by the President in 2007, I believe. And I asked him, I said, Ray, do you have your medal? And he said, yeah, it's over in the drawer somewhere there. So we had to go find it and fish it out, but uh, he was kind enough to do that. And, and we made this picture, and it's, it's become one of my favorites. Very nice man. Um, and he actually, after the war, he, he was in the last class before the war ended. And so they, and he was training in P-47 Thunderbolts, which is a fighter plane. And uh, so the war in Europe ended in May of 45, and they decided to transition them into bomber training because they thought they were going to, the war was going to continue, and they were going to have to um, bomb Japan. And so they started it in that training, and then, of course, the atomic bombs dropped and the war ended. And he got out of the service, went back into the service because jobs apparently were scarce, stayed in the service again a, a little while longer, and then got out and eventually retired as a police detective in Newark, New Jersey. Um, super guy. And this is Larry King, a friend of mine. He's an airframe and power plant mechanic, but he's also an aerobatic pilot. And this was shot last fall uh, in 2012 at our home field, uh, Briscoe Field in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Um, and I actually made my first video of Larry doing an air show routine at the Paulden County Air Show last fall. Um, and so this is for his self-promotion and so on. Um, this was shot for women in aviation. This is Debbie Reen Harvey, um, created at the annual conference last year in Dallas. and. Uh, Debbie lives in Texas. She's a captain for Southwest Airlines and also is three-time national aerobatic champion. Not in a row like Patty, but 
but uh, she is, I believe, the longest, uh, has the most appearances of any air, uh, aerobatic pilot on the U.S. national team uh, of anyone, and I believe it's over 13 years. Uh, it could be more than that. I have to look it up exactly, but she has a ton of international aerobatic competition experience. And she owns a flight school and, a, and an FBO down in, uh, just outside of Houston. Uh, very nice lady and uh, quite experienced, as you might imagine. Uh, this is Lieutenant Colonel Jill Long. Uh, I should say promotable. I just talked to her on the phone the other night, and it turns out that she has come out on a promotion list to full colonel. Um, this, again, was shot in 2009 in Oshkosh and was used on the cover of the Aviation for Women magazine just came out this month in March of 2013. Um, and as you can see, again, there's space left up here, and of course, that's where the title of the magazine appears. And there's space here for uh, the art director to use for articles in the magazine, etc. So, um, you know, a lot of times when you see pictures like that, they may not look finished, but to my eye, they are finished because that's all these negative spaces are intentional uh, for other uses. Um, this was shot in November of 2012 at Briscoe Field. This is a pilot um, who works for the Gwinnett County Police Department, uh, a uh, helicopter pilot. And um, I want to do more work along those lines. I flew in a lot of helicopters when I was in the service myself. And um, so, uh, I, I asked those guys if they would be kind enough, and they said, yeah, sure, and uh, we made some great pictures. They were very happy with them, and uh, we're probably going to do some more. And this is primarily that uh, his face is primarily that with the light coming out of the iPad. Uh, it was a four-second exposure, and we got lucky with a real aircraft going by in the background uh, with the streaks of light here that wasn't added later. Um, so... Um, and this is, I believe, the last image. This is Jerry Pellucci, who is a uh, mechanic, aviation mechanic, in the 50s while he was serving in the Marines. And it turns out that he worked on Corsairs. And this is a Corsair that was um, on the grounds during Oshkosh in 2012. And um, his daughter did some work for me while we were there. And that was her first trip. And she called her dad and said that she was going and asked if she wanted to come. And he said yes, and he was only scheduled to stay two days. And at the end of the second day, he liked it so much, he extended his stay another two days. So we made this picture um, one evening. Uh, and these are the clouds as they were. This is not Photoshopped or anything. We just got lucky. And it's become one of my favorite pictures also. Um, so there you have it. Um, that's just some of what I do and and the approach I take, uh, you know, both mentally and, and we didn't talk too much technically. We can do that another time, but um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation today.